Very good morning. Hope everyone had a fantastic weekend. Monday the 9th of September. Um, as per usual, Monday morning, this is very much a, a look ahead for the week. As you can see to the side of me, this is the, the kind of economic calendar of highlights, inclusive then of data, meetings. Um, I, I, I generally include everything on here, so any political things that are going on, like the prorogation of UK Parliament, which is expected to happen this week, so we're going to talk plenty about Brexit over the next few minutes. Um, but then I'll hand you over to Sam, so I'm going to spend very little time actually looking at the charts. From a technical perspective, I'll leave that to him to go over in more detail generally what we do uh, as a tandem. I'll, I'll pretty much take all of the technical analysis from last week off the charts and, and let him just start afresh so he can talk through as he's doing it and why he's doing it uh, when Sam comes on in a moment. Uh, but looking at the charts this morning, the currency markets, the dollar index is, is pretty flat overall, but some slight softness seen in the major pairs, particularly cable. Uh, and I think rightly so, given uh, the movement that we saw last week. I mean, we had such a decent run up in cable uh, after we had the, the passage, if you like, or we are awaiting the royal assent, of course, today. But that bill going through the lower house of parliament and then the upper house for confirmation of the fact that Brexit could well be delayed until uh, January of next year. And so a bit of profit taking coming in. There's plenty of news and more resignations that have come from cabinet members over the weekend, which we'll have a look at. Otherwise, elsewhere, gold pretty flat. Um, reflective really of just generally the news uh, that's come out over the weekend which has been relatively light. The Asia Pacific session was slightly positive um, after we had confirmation at the end of last week that China had once again uh, cut the reserve requirement, the triple R uh, ratio, that helping release some liquidity in the system to help offset what was some weak trade data that was seen over the weekend. So if you're looking at the center charts here in the future space, uh, the DAX, NASDAQ and S&P 500 futures all seen moderately higher this morning. S&P, of course, in a, a pretty tight range, just finding some resistance up at around the range high that was restricting some of the price action towards the end of last week. Um, T-notes consequently down a touch, about six ticks, and oil up about 64 cents. Uh, a couple of news items there also to be uh, aware of ahead of the joint ministerial monitoring committee meeting happening in Abu Dhabi later this week on Thursday. So let's jump straight into the news and we will circle back round to this um, calendar in a second. But I did briefly mention China. So this is what happened. Um, end of last week, we had Beijing cut the triple R. Uh, China cuts its bank reserve ratio, freeing up $126 billion for loans as the economy has slowed. So this not really coming as a great surprise. I'm trying to remember now, I think this is possibly the ninth cut to the triple R seen uh, since the onset of the, well, the last few years, let's say. And so it's just in fitting with the pledge that they've made uh, in order to do essentially whatever it takes to mitigate the downturn that's been clearly evident from the global slowdown emanating particularly from the, the stress on their economy from the ongoing trade war. Uh, the onshore yuan falls, Shanghai shares were up about 0.4% uh, and it, we also did see at the weekend China's August exports unexpectedly shrunk as of course US shipments slumped. Um, so again just giving further um, or warranting that the action of why they did what they did uh, at the end of last week. So that was kind of led the, the slight risk on tone to this morning, but it's nowhere near a kind of a runaway sentiment, I would say, so fairly neutral overall. So I'll still be keeping an eye on the equity markets. Uh, I think they'll probably settle here until the US come in, to be quite honest. A couple of big things coming up on the calendar, of course, later on in the week. Uh, this does come, though, in the, in the bigger picture of things with... Um, the non-farm payroll report, we obviously saw no real sustained impact from that, um, but, a, but a weaker headline than expected. And of course, then uh, this all lining us up quite nicely for the interest rate decision to come from the Federal Reserve, which is going to be next week on Wednesday, of course. Um, one thing, though, is that as far as markets are concerned, we are still expecting um, a cut of 25, not 50 basis points at this point. But the 
the ECB looking to, to lower interest rates this week. You've got the Bank of Japan last week talking about the idea of they'd be interested in talking about this idea of going further negative rates. You've got the Fed looking to cut rates along with their guidance that they're going to reissue next week. And you've got China cutting the triple R. So despite the overall global concerns that there are, we remain in this phase that as long as central banks globally uh, coordinate and remain in this accommodative stance, for the moment, it seems to be enough to keep sentiment just ticking over uh, for the time being. Enough of that, though. Let's get straight into on this weekly calendar. You can see one of the main things here I've highlighted in bold and underlined is the potential commencement of the prorogation of UK Parliament. So, of course, this was the one that was passed at the end of August, uh, surprisingly by Boris Johnson. But it does mean that as soon as today... Um, Parliament could be prorogued or happen in the coming days. Certainly by the end of the week, that will be underway. Not to reopen then until we get the official Queen's speech, I think on October 14th. Uh, And so hence the reason why we've had so much action of Brexit headlines over the last week or so, given that move and strategy by Boris Johnson. So what have we got to look out for? Well, today Parliament obviously reopens. Prime Minister Boris Johnson sticking to his Brexit plan will seek to delay or will will not seek an extension uh, or any delay to Britain departures from the European Union. Um, This, of course, though, could go against him in terms of legal law um, being passed in a royal assent from the Queen later today. And so if he does not abide by that, well, he is in effect breaking the law. So, so what that has meant is that this was leaked in the Sun or the Times newspaper from overnight. Boris Johnson is in retreat over delay on Brexit. So apparently here he is looking. <laughs> I love the photos that they managed to catch of these guys. Uh, but Boris Johnson has signaled to cabinet ministers that the government will have to accept a th- further three month delay to Brexit if it is forced on him by the courts. Now, to be clear, what happens here is, having gone through the House, lower and upper, it now goes to the Queen. Now, the Queen does actually carry some powers um, of rights to veto certain things. So, technically speaking, uh, the Queen might not give the royal assent, and therefore, it's game on again for Boris Johnson... And I would say if that were to be the case and that materialised, the Queen not giving her assent, then the pound would drop pretty dramatically today because the, we'll go into prorogation and then the risk of no deal is right back on the table. Now, what's the probability of that happening? Well, the probability is incredibly small because most people see uh, the fact of the Queen giving her royal assent as symbolic and purely a formality. Now, there are two things that she must consider uh, in order that if there was going to be a change, <coughs> excuse me, a change of mind. One is if she feels as though that there was a mistake on the actual law of which has passed so far, seen by her judgment, that one is seen as absolutely no way that would happen uh, because, you know, the, the remainers, let's say, have done a, a very good and solid job at making sure the wording appeases all the necessary legal requirements. The other one is that she can take advice from ministers. And over the weekend, of course, Boris Johnson was said to have been in conversations with the Queen. Now, could he say, you know, the fact that um, he's had to expel 21 of his Tory members because they're not following through with what he's saying? Could he say that the fact that the opposition have failed to Um, call a vote of no confidence in his government. The opposition have failed to adhere to the Prime Minister's request to have a general election. That means then that really the Queen should vote this down. Well, there's some of the reasons why she could go off the Prime Minister's reasoning and judgment. However, I would say it's highly unlikely that that's to be the case. I think the Queen will want to steer completely clear Uh, of any direct involvement politically in getting tied up into any of this. And I do very much expect that this will just go through as per the plan. Brexit then is delayed as per law, which means the PM would be breaking that if that were the case. 
So what does that mean? Well, today, actually, when Parliament reopens, Boris actually is going to call for a general election again. Uh, that, again, will get voted uh, or will not get the relevant backing of two-thirds of majority of Parliament. So instead of it being a quest for a general election, I would see it more as a political opportunity for the existing government and Boris Johnson to bash the opposition for not committing so far. But as we know, does this mean a general election is not going to happen, even though Brexit now technically, potentially by the end of the day, will be delayed? Well, no, because Boris, well, Jeremy Corbyn already said last week that as long as this goes into law, the delay, then he would back the call for a general election. So it's not a matter of um, if, but when, more so, that the general election will inevitably take place over the coming weeks or months at some point. Now, a few other things to be aware of. This is, well, let's just jump back to here. One of the other news headlines you probably saw was that Amber Rudd um, has quit Boris Johnson's cabinet. She was the Works and Pensions Secretary. She said the government was having no formal negotiations with the EU about a new deal, only conversations. She, in fact, said that 80 to 90 percent of Brexit work being done was spent preparing for a no deal. So, obviously, from her point of view, being someone who originally backed a Remain vote, um, she's kind of saying that, well, we're supposed to be an open party reflective of the different political views the fact that you've had to expel 21 Tory ministers um, and the fact that you're not really seriously looking to make any headway on Brexit because 80 to 90 percent of the time is being spent preparing for no deal not negotiation well, her position was untenable she said and so she has resigned this of course comes a week after his own brother uh, Joe Johnson has resigned uh, but he still has his faithful allegiance with Dominic Rabb, Sajid Javid sticking up for him, uh, both coming out saying that they're still following the government's plan and they must stick to that plan for the moment. Uh, so, yeah, a couple of different things going on. The pound backing off a little bit this morning, uh, but I'd say it's already down to its S2 on the daily pivots. Um, yeah, this is more... I would say a bit of profit taking. I think the run up last week was a bit overdone, in my opinion, for the current state of play. Uh, potentially quite a few shorts getting squeezed after we had that kind of failed breach through the 120 uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, and so just a little bit of downside pressure just coming through. But again, the, a risk could be the Queen does not give her royal assent to that bill. Uh, was it the Hillary Ben bill that passed? Uh, if that were to happen, I would be expecting um, a big spike lower in sterling. Uh, anything from a point plus, I don't think would be out of the realms for a daily session change. However, I'd, I'd assign a probability of, of the Queen not giving passage to that bill at about anything from 1% to 5%. So incredibly low if I was to, to give it uh, that kind of percentage probability. Um, the other thing that Boris is doing today, so you're aware, because you're probably going to get lots of headlines today on the Northern Irish border, because he is meeting the Irish PM, Varadkar, in Dublin today. Um, what's expected from this? Well, not a great deal. They're having a conversation, of course. Uh, but what the Irish PM has said is that nothing is expected to come of today. If there is any deal or compromise to be done, it's more likely to be done when there's that EU summit happening in about a month's time, five weeks' time, uh, ahead of the uh, what was or what could be now the previous deadline of October 31st. So just to point it out, you're going to get lots of headlines about Northern Ireland uh, and the border, I'm sure, today. Are we going to get any groundbreaking resolution? The answer to that is no. Okay. Other things are, go back to the calendar for a moment. Tuesday, uh, pretty quiet, not really too much going on overall. Um, some Chinese inflation data perhaps could be quite interesting. Remember, we've been having quite a divergence between CPI and PPI. PPI obviously weakening given the state of, like we saw at the weekend, a slump in US imports from China has meant that trade has decreased. 
So PPI naturally decreasing as manufacturing activity has slowed down. On the flip side though, um, CPI on the consumer side has been spiking because of food prices in particular and pork prices, uh, given what we've had with the likes of uh, not just trade talks, but the, the swine flu that's been impacting the pig situation in that region as well. So probably that will continue for the moment. That could be fairly interesting, though, to have a look at. UK average earnings data, um, I, again, takes a bit of a sideshow towards the political stuff that's going on at the moment. Wednesday, <coughs> again, pretty quiet. Um, we do get the OPEC monthly report, usually <coughs> monitored by energy traders to just get the latest on the, the global kind of demand and supply situation. Also the adherence to the OPEC compliance levels, of course, and this comes ahead of the joint uh, ministerial meeting happening in Abu Dhabi, which is gonna be on Thursday. Now on that point, talking of oil, this happened at the weekend. I'm not sure if you caught it, but quite a surprise announcement. Um, I didn't remember hearing anything really talking about the fact that Khalid El Fali, the former uh, energy minister, was going to be dismissed. But that is exactly the case of what's happened. Um, it's not immediately clear why uh, the Saudi king Salman removed El Fali, but analysts and officials, importantly, have said that the decision is unlikely to change the kingdom's oil policy. Now, his replacement is actually King Salman's son, uh, Prince Abdul Lawiz, who is a longtime top energy official. And so the point being is here, not expecting too much of any great change in direction to the commitment for Saudi con to uh, continue to push for further supply cuts and rollovers of these deals, and importantly, keeping Russia on side so it's an OPEC plus deal. Uh, will be key. So oil a little higher uh, this morning, in fitting generally with the, the correlations with the cross-asset class mix this morning. Um, I don't really see this as, as too much uh, of an issue, but something to just be aware of on the oil side. Um, back to the calendar. Thursday then is, is the interesting day and, and potentially really the highlight of the week. Uh, and this is because it's the ECB interest rate decision with the accompanying press conferences call, uh, press conference as well. Uh, and I believe you get the latest ECB staff projection. So this is one of the most important meetings for the ECB we've had in a while. Not only is it outgoing for Mario Draghi before he hands the reins over to Christine Lagarde, but we are expecting action from a policy perspective. So what I've done here is I've, I've printed out, as we can see here, time for shock and awe is the Reuters headline. And they've produced here a couple of graphics that will help explain the situation what's happening in the euro area and so first um, graph here is looking at money market expectations for ecb rates so it's looking at the eonia money market curve so kind of like what we look at typically with the federal reserve when we're looking at the fed watch tool this is a reflection of a similar thing so basically this orange line here is the floor here in this area of money market rate expectations now, what the bottom axis is here is a timeline. So you've got everything from basically one month out to 30 year on the far right hand side. And then the right axis, you've got the level of the deposit rate facility. So at the moment, the deposit rate obviously is here, minus 0.4%. The general consensus on the street is for a cut of 10 basis points to 0.5. The Reuters median forecast of depot rate for next quarter and through 2020 is for minus 0.6. So markets are already priced for uh, further cuts beyond what we've already had. And the floor of money market rates is actually down close towards minus 0.7. So just like market positioning for the Fed comparative to their actual central bank communication, i.e. markets always being much more dovishly priced, that's exactly the same case for the ECB. So as far as money markets show, we're looking for a trough in Eurozone rates in about three to four years before then the sharp recovery that, that is anticipated to be seen. As for QE, um, this encapsulates or everything right from the beginning of, of, of the quantitative easing program from the ECB to the unwinding of it to then the, um, the fact that QE actively has been stopped ever since the beginning of the year. 
We are expecting then Draghi's term to end and him to announce this Thursday that QE is set to recommence from October. That means then that potentially we could see the restart happening either then or towards the end of the year um, as we go into 2020. So we'd be expecting this to pick back up again. This is one of the other reasons why uh, the ECB are feeling as though they need to take action. The red dotted line, of course, is the ECB's inflation target of 2%. And what we have here are three metrics. You've got the uh, consumer price index and core inflation rate. So both of which reside at around 1.1 and 1.2% um, at the moment. So particularly low. We did see... <coughs> A slight spike in 2018, I'd imagine that was really linked to um, energy prices. Core inflation remained relatively flatline. This is the one that's been of most headache for the ECB, that core inflation for the last three years has gone nowhere. And what we have been seeing amid as well the economic slowdown in the euro area is that the eurozone inflation link swap, basically the five-year, five-year break-evens have continued to, to edge down lower. Meaning that basically further money supply, more quantitative easing is needed in order to fuel inflation again, particularly if we're going into an economic downturn as well at the moment. Uh, and then the final few things here is, well, what is the situation for total excess reserves of credit institutions subject to minimum reserve requirements in the euro area? And so excess reserves that need to be saw. Uh, this coming as, of course, the ECB wants to liquidate the system for any potential downturn that could be on the horizon, given what we've been seeing with the various inversions of the yield curve and so on, and comes at a time when Eurozone sovereign debt yield heat map, I know this is quite small, but essentially, if I just zoom this in for one second, these are all the countries going from Germany at the top to Greece at the bottom. And obviously, if you look at this, the entire German yield curve is negative. Uh, remember, the starting post for German yield is obviously much lower given the higher credit quality of its debt, whereas Greece, obviously, the complete opposite end of the spectrum. So all of Greek yields uh, being more speculative in nature given their lower credit ratings are much higher. But you can see here, more than half the board uh, is in negative territory at the moment. Uh, so this is one of the key things that a lot of people will be talking about when the ECB, ECB meet later. How effective can their quantitative easing program be and the parameters of which they do their purchases at the moment? Will they need to be tweaked in time? Okay, so that's the kind of ECB situation. All of that to come, of course, on Thursday. So that is a big one. And so if you're thinking about your trades around the euro currency, perhaps, uh, really, as we get closer towards Thursday, all the more it's probably going to sap a lot of market volume and liquidity into that event. For then, it's such an important one to see what happens next. Uh, the bottom line is, is that as far as Mario Draghi is concerned, this is kind of like his farewell meeting. Uh, it's, and not only are we expecting action, but Draghi seldom has, has really failed to, to not deliver in previous historical occasions. And we'll be expecting the same thing again this time round. Going through then to finish off the week, Thursday, US CPI, and then Friday, US retail sales will be important, of course. So that is pretty much it from me. Um, I'm going to post this video up onto the YouTube channel um, later on this morning. If you did have any questions at all about anything we've covered, please feel free to leave a comment on the video below. Me and Sam will be happy to answer as we go through the rest of the day. Otherwise, have yourself a good week. Um, lots of Brexit action likely going to be front loaded this week because of the fact that uh, Parliament will be prorogued this week. Uh, and as I've discussed, I'm uh, going to get another call for a general election. That's not going to happen from Boris Johnson. He's going to get voted down. Royal assent will go in. So all things being equal, then that will lead us into this down period where Parliament will be shut until we come back in the middle of October. Uh, but it doesn't mean in the interim period there's going to be lots of news in the, in the time in between. Okay, hand you over to Sam and he can talk over the charts and setups for the week ahead. All right, guys, take care. Thanks, Sam, and hope everyone had a, uh, a good weekend. Obviously.
Shame about England and the cricket, but congratulations, Australia. And, of course, Rafa Nadal, which I'm sure uh, Anthony is a bit annoyed about as uh, he's getting closer to taking over uh, Roger Federer. But we'll have a, a quick look over the pound and the euro to begin with, as, as Ant mentioned, likely to be front-loaded in, in that end for, for the pound. And, of course, ECB coming up, so we want to keep a, a close eye on, on what happens there. So starting off with the, the pound and... Uh, under pressure this morning and I was just having a look on uh, on the trading platform against some other pairs and there's some good levels coming up on the idea that we can get a bit of a retracement uh, this morning to then get short again and with the pound you could argue that would be around 122.57 which is well the current or the previous low of the day uh, just looking for, for areas like that that if we were to get any retracement uh, we can just get that continuation. Of course, headline risk is, is something to, to take into consideration. Uh, but uh, at the moment, the pound weak across the board and uh, euro pound as well is pushing above the R1, which is also coming to a couple of key levels just above where we're trading, which we'll have a look at in the moment. Uh, in a moment, I should say. 124, that, that retest of that multi-year trend line that broke never really got close enough. I think we were about 50, 50 40 ticks away from that uh, from coming in but for, for the pound if we can get any retracement uh, on all the pairs that's how I'd really be be looking to, to take that on below where we're trading uh, obviously got the the low that we had back on Thursday 2216 which would be the next real support level below where we're trading and 122 on the futures I just think uh, for optimal entry uh, a retracement to previous lows would be what I'd have uh, marked up and euro pound here just looking on a four hourly chart, you can see if we were to just push a bit higher up, we just come back to, and yes, it is another test, but you can see just how good a support point it was previously uh, in August. These lows here, we're not too far away from coming to test that there, 90.23 around that area, which of course was good price action point uh, in previous weeks and months as well. So worth keeping an eye on that for the euro and the pound. Just another retest of that level, but considering how good it was the support area, uh, you've got to imagine without a headline, it would struggle to initially get through that. Euro, obviously it's all about Thursday. It's all about Thursday, ECB, and uh, and having a look at this, you can see we uh, we came to, to retest on uh, on Thursday, what was a, a, such a key level. The failure to uh, to break and close above there uh, has seen us, us drift lower and just putting this back onto a 60 minute chart you can just see the importance of the low of the day that we had today as a whole area itself if i just draw a line up there you can see you've also got some lows that we had back on the fourth the fifth and almost friday as well so you'd have that as a as a big zone to to have marked up in, in the week ahead below there and it could well open up and then you would be looking at some of these highs that we had back on uh, the second uh, of uh, and third uh, of, uh, of September. So really key support coming in around 110.20. Uh, the pivot not too far away from getting tested. It's obviously an area, area to, to have marked up. But you can see just looking at uh, the previous days, just how choppy it has been around there. Uh, it might well be worth and uh, just marking up a, a bit higher up towards that R1 where you've got some cleaner price action, 110.59. So maybe uh, with Friday's high to low, that's the, the range to focus on for the week um, and your, your lines in the sand, of course, for, for going forward there. So to the downside around 110.20 uh, and 110.59 to uh, the upside uh, as well. Have a quick look over at US equities, uh, which of course have, have pushed higher after breaking uh, out of that longer term range that upside and we were saying you know don't want to get long unless we close above there we did on uh, on the fifth and when we came back to retest obviously the r1 on that day not quite uh one uh, 29.45 which is still a very key level for the week but we have continued to push higher uh, since then um and the i'd say well you've got obviously three thousand to the upside that's an area people will be looking at we are perhaps just running out a bit of momentum just failing to to close above those previous highs and you can see uh, here we're almost getting that third test this morning uh, of this trend as well so that around the r1 is is a key point today that's a, as good a line in the sand for before we get to 3000 uh, that you could want 
Uh, and then obviously to the downside, we've perhaps got this new range here where we had the high from Thursday, the lows from Friday, uh, around 29.71 uh, as well. So a couple key levels this intraday before we get to 3,000 and any test of 29.45 again, you, know, you could imagine there'd be some good support, headline permitting, uh, of course. The DAX this morning, obviously 35 minutes into uh, that opening increase in volume, it pushed higher to, to snap back lower, relatively quiet and subdued uh, as an open itself, but uh, obviously worth keeping an eye on that and the key level, albeit choppy this morning, Friday's high which has been tested already a couple of times as, as well. Uh, keep an eye, obviously, where we gap slightly higher on, higher on the futures uh, at 12,180. Uh, that would be another level to, to have marked up. Gold and silver, uh, unfortunately, if you were, uh, well, I guess if you've been long for a while, you're, you're happy to have taken profit and, and you know this move coming lower is, is probably just a bit of a correction that was needed with the uh, the Trump comments on that Thursday. You can see that push lower, but we are just starting to test these lows a couple of times. Silver very much uh, similar to, to gold in this respect. We're just knocking on the door uh, again this morning. We keep coming down to test this area. 15.10 it is on, on gold. and if that is to go I know you've got all the the lows let's move this above the camera from 1502 but 1500 psychologically on the futures will be worth having uh, an eye on there and then of course where when could this drop happen uh, not the worst idea and just having a trend line there to see if we can get the third test uh, and then a breakthrough but 1510 important for the uh, well, the day but also the week perhaps as the last uh, support point before getting down to 1500 to the upside the pivot is key you can see decent price action there as well uh, we'll go through obviously some of these levels longer term in the strategy that we go through but certainly for gold and silver uh, in terms of just these lows that keep getting hit over the last few days very important points uh, 18 you know just well we almost touched it on the futures this morning um, but also uh, some key levels around that S1 you can see here from the beginning of uh, the 26th uh, and then we tested it a couple of times before breaking through that would be somewhere to have marked up there uh, but silver not looking you know, too bullish right now as of gold really needs to hold that level. Quick look over at oil to, to wrap things up and as I mentioned just drifting higher this morning has just settled down a bit and has been drifting uh, down. If we put this on that, that longer term chart, it's, uh, it's been tricky, I guess, to, to really think about where this market is, is going to, to go. We had the, uh, the break of a, a trend only to, to sort of snap back on Friday. We are now back above that. We can just see how messy uh, that has been. And we're testing, uh, or we tested, we say Friday, the top end of uh, the 13th of August. And now we're sort of in this this area where it's, uh, I guess you could say, a bit of no man's land. While the last, and including today, one, two, three, four days to the upside, uh, you feel that 57, 52 really has to break. Uh, and then the next level uh, has a bit more to go, dollar and a half above that, around 58, 82 uh, as well. So, you know, it could be an important week for oil. Um, certainly, if we have a look more intraday, put those pivots on, you can see uh, the retest of what has been a choppy trend line anyway would also this time be the, the morning high from the from Friday as well. So 56.50, pretty key to the downside. Uh, and of course, R1 and a retest of, of Friday's high, uh, an important area as well. As usual, any questions, uh, please do let us know. Safe Havens is coming under further pressure this morning. The Bund now uh, down 49. T-notes. Uh, which for the morning a decent move already breaking that pivot as well and gold and silver under pressure uh, keep an eye obviously on on those equity markets which aren't really moving as such uh, the euro up towards that pivot as well uh, we said probably a bit of a, a bit of a choppy area however already any questions as usual uh, please do let us know looks to be a, a decent week obviously UK the focus to begin before we look at uh, that ECB on, on the Friday, on the Thursday, sorry, uh, as we see in some nice US numbers as well to wrap up Thursday and Friday. So it should be a, a decent week ahead. Hope you all have a, a good one and uh, I'll catch you all later on.